Okay, so it is uh, nine o'clock uh, in uh, <laughs> in Australia, in Brisbane, in Queensland. It's twelve o'clock uh, in New Zealand, and uh, possibly what time is it, Seta, in uh, New York? Seven p.m. in the evening, dinner time <laughs> in New York. So thank you for uh, for coming and being with us today. So this is uh, the second lecture, third lecture of the thought-provoking conversation past forward series. Uh, of the School of Architecture and Planning of the University of Auckland, organized by the Urban Design Hub. This lecture is sponsored by JIB, who have consistently supported this series for many years. I'm Manfredo Manfredini, I'm an associate professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at the University of Auckland, and current director of, of, the, of architecture. I'm delighted to introduce the, the speakers tonight, which is Seta, who is Seta Lowe. Seta began her career in landscape architecture and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania and is currently a distinguished professor of environmental psychology, geography, and anthropology, and director of the Public Space Research Group at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. During her brilliant career, she received a Getty Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Humanities Award, a Fulbright Senior Research Grant, and a Guggenheim Fellowship for Public Space Research. Her interest in public space has a tremendous breadth and that long-standing focus on social justice, democracy, and social, uh, social solidarity. She has extensively studied public space in Latin America, Europe, and the US, developing a multi-method spatial inquiry that can be defined as comparative and conjunctural. Recent books include the Specializing in Culture, Anthropology and City, Spaces and Security with Mark McGuire, and the Why Public Space Matters, which is uh, actually the title of the talk today. CETA is also a board member of the non-government organization City Space Architecture, an organization that uh, in a few weeks will open the Public Space Academy, an online program developed in collaboration with UN Habitat Group and our foundation. Why Public Space Matters presentation examines how public space contributes to individual and societal flourishing. Based on 35 years of ethnographic fieldwork on plaza, workways, park, markets, and beaches in the United States, Costa Rica, Argentina, India, Kenya, and France, it presents a new understanding of a role of the role of social contact, public culture, and affective atmospheres in the creation of places essential to everyday urban life. The presentation emphasizes people's experience of representation, recognition of difference, inclusion, and care as well as opportunities for contestation and resistance. It will discuss case studies that demonstrate how public space provides a context for socialization and improves physical and mental well-being by showing how sidewalks, parks, and plazas offer endless relational opportunities through both formal and informal activities that promote a sense of belonging, a place, a place attachment, as well as transmit cultural practices. Overall, sort of, so CETA will use uh, is taught to advocate for a realignment uh, of urban priorities by highlighting the importance of public space for social justice and encouraging local activism. Without further ado, I would invite to give you the floor to Seta and thank you in advance uh, for being uh, available and sharing with us uh, all your uh, understanding culture in such a short time that probably will make it hard for you to <laughs> really express uh, the, the, the very incredible complexity of the resource. Please. Well, thank you so much, Manfredo. I'm going to share my screen and start my uh, slide. Sadly, I can't see you. Um, and that always leaves us with this sort of strange feeling that I don't know quite who I'm talking to. But I want to say welcome to those of you who are here. I'm really delighted um, that Manfredo thought of inviting me to speak in New Zealand. Um, hopefully, someday, I'll be able to do that in person. Um, I am celebrating with you um, the suit, my soon to be published Why Public Space Matters book um, that was uh, heavily funded by the Future for Places and my university um, has taken over seven years to put together. And um, this is an attempt, I've actually cut it down quite a bit um, to tell you a little bit about what the book covers and to offer us an opportunity to, to think together about it. Um, the, I will hope to talk about, of course, why it matters and what it is. And then I will look at essentially, and I'll return to this, six contributions, six areas of contribution um, that pub what public space does for us. And this is just a drop, really, of all of public space, um, what it can do for us. But it, it's 
particularly those um, aspects that I felt were best represented in some of the ethnographic studies. And uh, each of these contributions will be illustrated by a case study. Um, and um, I understand that question asking is not going to be so easy to do. So um, if you have questions, just, I guess, email me. Um, so let's start. What, why does public space matter? Maybe at this moment in time, after we've gone through COVID and here in the United States, Black Lives Matter, we know why public space matters because we suffered so much when we didn't have it. But I'm going to talk about, argue that public space matters because if public space is for all. I'm really talking very specifically public space matters when it is for everyone, when it really does address social justice concerns. And I have been able, or I have identified three theoretical and now maybe even a fourth mediator that moves us from public space um, to its successes contact public culture and affective atmospheres. And then I'm going to turn to public space and its contributions. So why does it matter? I think we all know it provides an opportunity for social interaction, especially among people one would not normally encounter or among people who don't normally encounter one, one another. This perspective highlights the value of human connections and the importance of protecting space for spontaneous interactions and for problem solving. Um, without public spaces, people don't necessarily have the opportunity to make these unusual spontaneous interactions, but they also don't, don't have places to come together to solve the daily problems that they're facing. Um, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> uh, why does it matter? The first principle um, that I look at on how it matters, what it is that happens in public space that makes it matter is contact. Um, Intergroup contact is an agent of cognitive liberalization. It, it's, I know we've always talked about contact as being in, in, you know, important, but there is an over 50 year literature um, and there was a review done in 2018 uh, to explore this contact hypothesis that interaction between members of different groups will reduce prejudice and Im improve social harmony. And this meta-analysis of, I think it's over 50, 500 and some studies found that direct contact, cross-group friendship, even indirect contact and simulated contact contribute to positive outcomes. And these kinds of positive outcomes include deprovincialization, a broader worldview and ideology, contributes to better problem solving, more flexible thinking and creativity. So it isn't just that we say contact is important. Um, there is a deep now literature that can substantiate it from psychology that, that, that contact makes these difference and that it is a liberalizing agent and it shapes human cognition and experience that operates in tandem with other forms of liberal education. So psychologists say that contact is good for much more than is commonly recognized and is, a, and is basic to a central theory of human psychology. So. Um, but uh, there's been a lot written about contact in public spaces and criticism of that contact in and of itself will not necessarily create successful public space for all. Again, when I say successful, I'm meaning diverse, socially just space that welcomes everyone. Um, and so I have begun to think about and theorize a second component that is really necessary for us to have the kinds of public spaces we want. And I've called it public culture. Um, it's probably not the best term, but it's the best term I've come up with at the time that I wrote this book. If you have better ideas for terms, I would be more than happy. Um, but the concept of public culture re refers really broadly to the dynamic negotiation of beliefs, values, and attitudes, usually through media and social practices um, that are defined by norms of open access. I mean, it comes from, one part of public culture comes from the idea of 
uh, the communication literature. Um, these processes of negotiation that produce this public culture involve conflict, contestation, and other kinds of race, class, and gender struggle. You all know the work of Don Mitchell and all of our critical geographers who've written so much, but it includes community building, collaboration, and the social construction of meaning. Public culture is that which mediates the relationship of the public space and the public sphere. In other words, between the actual material space itself and the uh, circulating political, ideological um, circulation of ideas of interconnection of symbols and people. So pub public culture is this intermediator between the place, the, the material instantiation and the circulation um, that permeates the public sphere. And one might even argue that the more that uh, public space can encompass everyone, the more the public culture will be able to process and uh, come up with sort of it, uh, temporary stabilization of, 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 of people's ideas, beliefs, and practices. And the more that that widens and opens up the public sphere to other publics and counter publics. And the third piece of, I think, the puzzle is you can have contact and you can have even the development of public culture, which in the book I explained can develop over time, is very unstable, always changing, but has a sense of solidarity at any one moment. But there's a third component, uh, affective atmosphere, that I think is also critical to contributing to contact, uh, being successful, public culture of forming, and um, its affective atmosphere. And Anna Barker and her colleagues who study Victorian parts and leads were one of the groups that have uh, done research on how affective atmospheres uh, contribute to conviviality and feeling connected. Um, a affective atmosphere, uh, uh, excuse me, a park atmosphere of mutual affinity for place you know, it's like we all love this place, we all feel a certain way at it, creates opportunities for social encounters and promotes indifference to difference, which is what really where we're going. Um, an affective atmosphere is not limited to experience perception by a group or an individual, but I've been arguing it's an attribute of the place. And i um, been reading recently the literature, for those of you who know the French literature on ambiance, um, and the UK literature on atmosphere and um, ambient. Um, there is a quite now a thick literature in the last, I'd say, t uh, 10 years, arguing that places have, at have attributes um, that are shared among people, that these affects travel. Um, it doesn't require an event or social movement to exist though events can trigger an atmosphere, whether it's positive like Woodstock or VE Day or negative like 9-11 or um, a, shooting, a shooting of Martin Luther King. Um, let me give you an example. Um, in New York, the, the Yankees are a very important baseball team. And if you go to a Yankees game and the Yankees win, you go out in the parking lot can you imagine how everyone is behaving? Um, they're patting each other on the back. Uh, people in cars are honking. People talk to each other who don't know each other. There's a lot of conviviality and social interaction um, going on. But when they lose, everybody walks away silently. That's atmosphere. And that's how atmosphere can, in fact, make a huge difference in public space. Um, so it contributes to uh, conviviality and social interaction. But I would like to argue that without a supportive and egalitarian public culture, it's not likely to create a socially just public space. I mean, you can certainly have a positive atmosphere and still not necessarily have an egalitarian public culture where everyone and can participate. So um, this is a very crude model, but it, it, it gives you some idea of the way I came to think about this, that every public space has antecedents. There's a history, demography, a government policy, the geography of the place, the kind of environment, the amount of water, the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that, that public spaces have 
all kinds of just of attributes to begin with. Um, maybe antecedents is not the right word. Maybe it should just be attributes. But then the piece that I'm focusing on and trying to demonstrate through ethnography um, is how contact, public culture, and affective atmosphere work together to create these uh, public space outcomes. And you can see now I've put social media in there because I gave this presentation just a week ago in Slovenia, a much longer version of it, uh, which is why I've cut it down. It was really long. Um, and I think more and more in most parts of the world that we need to also think of maybe there's a fourth variable or a discursive variable because so many people are actually going on social media even before they go to a public space so that there would be contact, public culture, affective atmosphere and some dimension of social media. Anyhow, I haven't worked it out and I would be really interested in what you think, but you know, I, I've written previously that um, discourse, like how we talk about public spaces, certainly change how we feel about them. So maybe another mediating variable is the discursive practices, whether they be social media or newspaper articles about this dangerous and dark place. But these mediating variables, or these, maybe if you don't want to use such a a quasi-scientific language, these, these, these components of what I think see going on in public space are, 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 are part of what allows health and resilience and sustainability and social justice and creativity and social cohesion and infrastructure um, to, to occur as outcomes. Um, and then, of course, what is public space? And I'm not going to spend much time on this because I assume most of my audience knows the answer. But I do think whenever we start this kind of conversation, what do we mean by public or publics? You know, can a public exist in the private sector? Does public mean governmental? Or as Dewey and Habermas argue, the public is formed as a corrective to state power and outside the private or per personal profit mode sphere. Uh, what creates greater publicness? I think I'm finding more and more and more, and again, in the literature, we're moving much, much closer to talking about the production of publicness and how we produce it, um, rather than thinking of public space as something given. And then what kind of space? Uh, do we include physical, virtual, or imaginary spaces? Um, don't have time to talk about it, but I think it's so. I think at this point, I really am thinking that virtual public space and imaginary public space play a role. But do these same mediating it do contact public culture um, and atmosphere make a difference? And um, maybe it does. But I have mostly studied uh, physical and and you know with just a little bit of work on virtual spaces. One outcome of my working simply uh, in this book, in a chapter on what is public space, is I want to argue that I find it much more helpful um, to get out of our conundrum of what is public space, of what is publicness, and on and on, is to really start with a multidimensional definition. Um, I, I uh, imagine, and I, again, I wish I had another slide of this, but it, it um, that, 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 that some spaces are large, they're virtual and physical aspects, how big it is, the shape, the location, how digitized it is, or how uh, technological it is. And that public spaces vary and ownership, is it public, limited partnership, public, private, private. That what's the authority that runs it? Is it a bid, a homeowners association, a common interest development, an NGO? Um, and what forms of control and influence um, then does that governance agency use? Is it rules and regulation? Are they strict to lenient? Is access open or closed? Is there cost? Is there fencing, et cetera, et cetera. But there's also the symbolic and hor uh, historic meaning of the space. Is there representation and recognition? Is there, are there a lot of uh, historical uh, representations or, or contemporary representations that would encourage people to come in? Um, can political activity be, is it possible or is it prohibited? And, um, and the final idea was, 
is are there aspects of civil society that can happen there? It, uh, is it an informal forum for ideas all the way to not? I, I'm not going to um, belabor this, but the point here is I'm making is that it doesn't make sense to compare all kinds of public spaces with public spaces. I think one needs to begin to develop a much richer vocabulary because a place like Central Park in New York City that many of you might know is definitely public. It's owned by the city, but the governance authority, and it's very large, right? And the governance authority, however, is a, uh, a public as a conservancy, um, almost the entire funding of that park now is by the Central Park Conservancy, and control and influence is determined by them. So that there are very strict rules and regulation. You can no longer have political activities there. The symbolic meanings of the space are quite white in terms of a U.S. Um, context. Um, so it's not public in quite the same way that. Prospect Park is, in which um, some of these attributes are really quite different. Anyhow, just to give you a sense that uh, what I'm arguing is, is in terms of going forward, I don't think to think about public space just as one, one thing, but to begin to pull it apart and compare like with like, or begin to understand how these different dimensions of public space work. Okay, so um, I can't ask you if, uh, if I'm going too fast, um, because I couldn't see it. <laughs> I couldn't see it. Uh, let's see, so the Zoom late, yeah, I don't know how to do it. Okay, well, someone tell me, it says, please ask professor to change the settings so the Zoom label will not. All right, I don't know how. If somebody could please send me a chat, those Zoom labels are driving me crazy too, and I don't know how to close them. I, I would say to try to slide it to the side. If you can just uh, click and slide it, ah. yeah, perfect, yeah. Is that better? Can, I don't think that's, can I get it totally out of the way? How about I put it down here? Yep. Is that better, everyone? Okay, yep. thank you. Thank you to all. Yeah, I it, it was bothering me too. I literally didn't know what to do with it. I apologize. All right, so I'm- okay, very no, Not a big problem because it was just on the heading, which was always the same. So we didn't lose okay. any fundamental information. Right, good. Anyway, it, it, it was, I couldn't see it either. So thank you so much. Um, all right, excuse, let me go back. Come on. No. There. Um, I, I'm going to look at six, uh, six case studies. Um, the first three will be very place-based and the second three will not. Um, I'm going to emphasize uh, that these are ethnographies and the reason that I think ethnography is so important in the study of public space is, is what I'm going to show you is you can hear in people's words and how they talk about a place. Um, I think you can see the evidence that uh, of its contribution. And I've had, I've narrowed this down uh, you know, quite a bit. So you'll just get a taste of what the ethnography is and um, some of the dimensions of um, the, the contribution that I'm talking about. And um, these are the six that I'll be talking about, but I just to give you some sense. So I'm gonna start at, at the beach. So beach weather is already uh, changing here, which is Jones Beach, Long Island, which is a state park that was built in the 1920s by Robert Moses for the New York City middle class. And it is includes beaches, there's a bathhouse, there's a long boardwalk, there's a marina. It's a huge park. And it actually was designed for the middle class and actually in such a way that it was not meant, um, it was meant to exclude uh, essentially poor uh, members of, of society. Moses, as we know, was quite racist and, um, was not particularly interested in the urban urban uh, people of color coming out to Jones Beach. But ironically for um, Moses, who's no longer with us, um, social inclusion and belonging, one of the most important attributes of social justice and democrat, uh, democratic practices is very, very high, that people talk about Jones Beach in this way. This is America, said a man from the Bronx. At Jones Beach, there's a friendly crowd. People are out with family and friends. It's a diverse place. I feel welcome here. 
And that the first time I visited this park with my wife, a man originally from El Salvador said, I finally felt like I belonged in this country. We played in the ocean with hundreds of other folks. Somehow this made me feel special. So it gives you some idea of the power of a park to, to, to and, and I have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of interviews from there that say the same kind of thing. But not only is there a sense of belonging and, and social inclusion, there's a recognition that not everyone is the same, which is another really important dimension of social justice. Um, this uh, one person says, everyone should have a chance to access this beach. There are lots of families here. It's pretty lively. Everyone gets along. That's what New Yorkers are, tolerant. And it says a group of young Southeast Asia, Asian Indian men from Valley Stream concur that the park is inclusive. One member says there are more brown people playing ball and hanging out. It's getting more animated. People do not look at you just because of your color. That um, it's a place where you can go and be yourself and be recognized as different and still tolerated and accepted. Uh, I'm just giving you a smattering of some of the ways social justice, I'm not talking about, I don't really have time to talk about representation and contestation and resistance, which are also attributes of social justice and democratic practices. But I, I've also um, selected out the ethic of care, which I think is another dimension that public space offers um, and is important to a social justice uh, perspective. And a member says, when you're walking in the park, you feel you are walking in something great, says a park goer, describing why they care about their park. Advocates, friends, and local workers have collaborative, collaborated to restore the facilities that were part of the original design. And you can see people working here. And they have gotten together to restore the West Bathhouse and the pool. I mean, some of this, it's true, comes from state money. But there are other ways in which people show care. Um, they collect garbage. They put the garbage together. Um, they share uh, all kinds of, uh, if you don't have matches or you don't have something to start a fire, um, if you didn't bring up a bath towel, people are constantly sharing and showing care for one another and for the environment itself. I wonder why having a little trouble with it going. Um, the second example is this bridge that you can see here in front of you, which is walkway over Hudson. And um, probably sustainability and health and well-being right now are the two um, attributes or contributions of public health that I think we're hearing most about these days, probably because it's actually measurable. It's hard to measure um, uh, social justice, though I have developed um, I have developed a way to try to measure and evaluate it. But the fact that parks really are contributing to the improvement of health of people in an area is really going, is really now being documented all over the world. And this is about a historic train trestle. It's between two towns. Um, one is Poughkeepsie, this is north of New York City, and the other is Highland. And these were towns that are deindustrialized towns with high crime, uh, a kind of failing uh, sort of population is leaving, uh, very few jobs. Um, and uh, Poughkeepsie is famous for having an elite college, but the, the infrastructure of these two towns has been crumbling over the last oh, 20, 25, 30 years even. Um, and um, this, this uh, restoration of this historic uh, train uh, park into a walkway has, completely turned around uh, the community in one particular way in through the physical, the way it in fact attracts people to uh, participate in doing something about their physical health. And here's a visitor who runs several times a week and she recognizes the faces of other uh, visitors. She says it motivates her to exercise, to be on the bridge, to see the scenery. She talks about picking up the pace of a run when she gets to the bridge because the air is cool and the wind makes her feel alive. 
And another person says that she says, I love looking at the boats and down at the water and the houses. I love being outside like this. It's a backup plan for not going to the gym. Sometimes it's too nice outside, outside and I don't want to be inside, so I come here. So that the bridge and the beauty has really encouraged and the accessibility, as you can see, there's all kinds of ways of moving across this bridge have really made an impact on the physical health of the community. But it's not just physical health, it's also the mental health and well-being. Here's a middle-aged African-American man. He talks about going to the bridge as a means of preventing having another stroke. Um, he says it's mentally therapeutic for, this, for him. He says, the bridge is my sanctuary. I love the water. I don't want to go in the water, but I love looking at it. It helps me think. It makes, uh, helps make sense of my life. Uh, and again, people time and time again talk about the mental health attributes of having a bridge where you can go and see scenery and be outside, as well as the physical benefits. It also offers, I mean, it's a really important space, I think, because of a sense of security. I mentioned to you that Poughkeepsie and Highland are, are high crime areas. Um, they have actually a lot of violent, of violent crime, more violent crime than property crime, um, somewhat unusual in that way. And so to have a place where uh, there are types of people, uh, this woman saying, I think there are types of people who just walk here to have a peaceful experience and to free their mind of whatever is on it, especially when you're working out. I think one of the reasons I come to the walkway is because I feel secure and I can get lost in my, thought, lost in my thoughts. It's a very peaceful place. Um, other people mention the dogs and that the dogs are so friendly. And, and that's sort of a sense of security that you can even go there and that the dogs will allow you to be pet them. But the sense of security, relaxation, whatever, really contributes, um, again, to the health and well-being that this uh, walkway has offered. And finally, and probably um, one might argue from a community point of view, community health point of view, rather than at the individual level, is the sense of resilience that it has created for this, these communities. Um, one, one visitor said, uh, you know, she had known that the, the community worked for 15 years to build this walkway. And she said, Poughkeepsie is a place that has been overlooked, but democracy works. The people saved their own great walkway. They honored it by saving it. And a younger Highland resident shares the same sense of pride. She said, I used to walk, work at a uh, outlet in Poughkeepsie. And I remember having handouts for the walkway way back when they were making plans to rebuild the bridge. It's kind of nice to see that all the hard work paid off. And just to give you a sense is that um, the the housing prices unfortunately have gone up, um, which is something I guess we could talk about gentrification, but at the same time, there has been more jobs, incomes have increased, uh, sense of vitality, people are coming from the city, people's children are staying in the community, and um, there, you know, there is a real sense of revitalization. So it's kind of community health, not just individual health. There is, there is some trick. Okay. Um, Lake Welch, New York. So play, recreation, and creativity is a contribution. You would say, well, I know, of course, parks are for recreation, but do we really think about do we really think about how important it is um, to have uh, play and recreation and creativity for everyone? Um, and this is about a lake that is, um, uh, again, about 40 minutes from uh, New York City. Um, and it's very popular with uh, Latinos, both Hispanics and Latinos, particularly from the Northern section of New York. Um, it's a major destination. And when you interview, it's, um, interview people there, um, one of the first things they point out and something I think we tend to overlook and maybe under, undervalue or sh though we shouldn't is the socialization of children. 
So this is a place where the Spanish language and cultural practices give people a strong sense of community. I mean, everybody is freely roams back and forth. Uh, people are nice, it says, whenever I need a lighter for the barbecue, somebody lends me one. This is a place has many Latinos. We gravitate towards them when we hear people speaking Spanish. It's a normal human reaction. Um, and then someone else says on the promenade, he says, I see families, little children, young people playing games. It's a good place. Um, coming with family and friends, there's really only one day, Sunday, where we can see each other. And this is the place, you know, where we can be together. A lot, a few visitors said the exposure to nature was important for their children, while others thought that, oh, there's a typo, that pursuing their recreational activities uh, in a natural setting had a particularly uh, sal uh, salubrious effect. Um, it's really amazing to watch the kids um, run back and forth between uh, between the sites and, you know, it, it's, it's really an incredible place and watch families, you know, very fluidly uh, admonishing the kids to do what they should. And, and again, many of the interviewees really talk about how important it is to have a place where their Latinoness or that their culture can be expressed and shared and where the kids can see that there are other people like themselves and feel part of this much larger community. Um, I think you'll see in this one, uh, relaxation of course is another attribute of, uh, of a public space. And here's one woman saying, one could get the stress off by relaxing with others here in this na uh, natural and highly sociable setting. So this one, an older woman was sitting there with many family members and she, was pointing out the contrast of the environment. And she said, the park gives her a chance to clear her mind, uh, despejarse, she said. We like the beach, the water, and we live closed within a room, in cerrados. Here we get to go out. So it's not just re uh, re uh, relaxation, but it's being able also to just be outside to be together um, in an outdoor environment, which is not possible in the very dense um, fabric of uh, New York City environment, especially in a place like the Bronx, which is a very urban environment. Um, and then of course, reflection and memory. Um, the park reminds many visitors of their own childhood experiences elsewhere. And, and, it, and so one couple saying, it reminds us playing outside in Mexico when we were children. And then they go on to tell me that um, you know, they want to share those experiences with, with their children, and this is a place where they can do so. And that's been true of so many public spaces that I've worked in, especially working in New York, where there are many, many, many people from other places who had very different experiences, and often those in very natural places, rather than in the hard streets of New York City or the urban streets of New York City and um, really appreciate being able to share those experiences with their children. Um, here's another childhood memory coming here with my parents when I was a kid on Sundays. You know, we'd have four or five cars, just so having all the family together, together every Sunday, knowing it would happen was something to look forward to. I think something that we forget is um, particularly for certain, uh, for certain families and types of people. And I will emphasize those from Latin America and the Caribbean, and in many cases, African-Americans um, in the United States want to socialize as families, want to be together as families. And they have very, very large families. I mean, here at Lake Welch, sometimes 30 tables were brought together so everybody could barbecue together. And um, to have uh, public spaces where this can happen and have people, um, uh, uh, you know, it encourages diversity, but it also encourages and allows people to um, be together in large family groups, which again, it's not possible, at least in a very dense urban city, which you're not living in, but I am here in New York. Um, another aspect of public space that I think gets overlooked. I mean, I sort of mentioned that health and sustainability are really important now, but other things get overlooked, which is the in informal economy and social capital. And 
This is a cartonero here picking up trash in Buenos Aires from my colleague, uh, Mario, Mariano Perlman. But you need to remember that streets and sidewalks and plazas and parks are full of people working. If you ask me what the most important thing is, and I think globally, not New York, but globally, is the most important part of public space is working. Because 60% of workers in the global south work in the informal economy. They need flexible workplaces and they work in public spaces. Um, uh, you know, the majority of the population is working in public spaces and they need to be able to, to make a living and support their families. And it depends on access. Um, and, it, and, and public space allows for a lot of flexible flexibility about kind. So we have all kinds of innovative forms of work. I mean, this is a sidewalk, sidewalk cafe in Burma, Myanmar, if you prefer. Um, you know, you see these sidewalk cafes all over the world and these, these sidewalk cafes, the use of the public space is a piece, of, is how they make their living and how actually it grows the economy of the city. Um, but even in the United States, public space has become, is very important. I would argue vendors, which we're not gonna talk about, public markets, which I'm not gonna talk about, have all kinds of valuable um, attributes. Um, but public space is often where immigrant workers get first integrated into the workforce. The public market markets, and these are day workers who use the pub, uh, use the sidewalk to get jobs each day in my neighborhood. Um, th this is really vital to, to their making a living, keeping a job. And this is true the world over. And I've written quite a long and extensive chapter that talks about it. And the other thing about the informal economy is it's critical after a disaster. Um, it, you know, Puerto Rico just had another <laughs> hurricane, but after Maria, um, places began, so those places with public spaces uh, survived better. They were places people who grow gardens, they were places they could sell, there were places that um, could be adapted for all for living. Um, so to, they, they, the, the informal economy um, part of public space is really critical in most of the parts of the world. Really don't know that much about Auckland specifically. I don't remember seeing uh, a lot of vendors on the street, but you know, things could have changed. And, um, but in most of the world, most of the world where I live in uh, do field work, um, it's really critical. Um, environmental and ecological sustainability. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, just a bit. Uh, I, I walked away from writing Why Public Space Matters, being convinced that the greatest promise for changing urban environments are urban gardens and public space. I am absolutely convinced that I can't do much about global warming at a, prac at a macro level. I mean, I, I can't make industry stop doing what it's doing. But I do know that each and every one of us can fight much harder than we have to, to reuse the land that we have in our cities for gardens at, that have both social and ecological and uh, water runoff and you know, ecosystem, ecosystem services uh, qualities that are critical to sustainability and making our cities cities um, livable. Um, but um, there are, is a movement um, called uh, the Sustainable Parks Movement. Uh, is there one, um, Manfredo, I, you can actually hear me. Is there one in Auckland? Do you have a sustainable park? Because I think you do. I don't know, he's not I'm answering. I'm so. aware of, but I will, I will get back to you. <laughs> Maybe okay, you can add to that. All right. Anyway, this is a sustainable park in Paris. Um, and uh, it's, um, and anyhow, there's been a lot of research on this park and actually Galen Kranz has done a lot of work with Michael Bolin uh, uh, trying to look at sustainable parks to see if they're really sustainable, are they ecological? And sadly, most of them, there's certainly 
they use the language and they are greener and they do sometimes think about water runoff, but whether or not they're truly sustainable or not, or whether sustainability has only become a kind of metaphor or, um, you know, brandy and a marketing, that's something she's skeptical about. But I think with time, more and more parks are will be sustainable, especially if we take an ecosystem services point of view. Um, I think we need to move away from the term environmental sustainability and think a lot more about eco ecosystem services and really think about parks and green areas as making a difference. So I am convinced that we should indeed uh, plant trees everywhere we humanly can. Trees do an amazing amount of work in a city and, and parks in our public space, if we could green it all, uh, tear up all the pavement, you know, we could do something about runoff and heat island. So anyhow, I am quite optimistic that public space is one of the important areas to work on and sustainable parks will become much, much, much more important, especially if they're very large scale. But ecological planning and design, which was very popular when I started uh, my work, uh, you mentioned I was in landscape architecture. I worked for Ian McCarg, where we planned Sanibel Island, which just had its causeway blown down and people got stuck on the island because they overdeveloped and didn't do any of the things that we told them to do 30 years ago. But, you know, that if they ignore it, but, you know, here's an island that we told them that they, you know, that this, these storms were going to come and destroy the island and the bridge. But if we if we took the advice of ecological planning and design, I do think that our public spaces could make a difference. Um, and um, anyhow, and integrating uh, systems of public spaces in, in through um, an ecological planning process um, as was advocated 40 years ago, and uh, it, we're still hesitant to really take it on full force. Though there are some practitioners um, like Kate Orff who, are, who is beginning to really take some of the ecological planning design seriously, but but public space is is again the centerpiece of that. Don't know, and of course, uh, as Julian Agumon brings up, it shouldn't just be sustainability, but just just sustainability. And um, to be thinking about sustainability without thinking about social justice, I would argue to think about public space without thinking about public space for all or public space and social justice. I don't think we're going to get anywhere, you know, that that to me isn't going to be successful. So, again, for the sustainability uh, component of, of public space, the contribution that can be made, it's only going to be a contribution if it's a just kind of sustainability that it incorporates everyone. But I think that permeates all of these uh, different aspects that I'm talking about. And finally, the concluding contribution. Um, is on cultural identity and place attachment. I mean, what anthropologist isn't going to say something about the importance of public space um, for identity? I hope you all know this is Stonehenge in the UK, which is still uh, a place of identity formation, even today as it was in the, uh, in the past. Um, but I, I also uh, suggest, suggest our looking at places and public spaces um, that generate place attachment, like the Statue of Liberty, where we did a, a, a interesting study of what are all the ways that we attach to public spaces, that public spaces are, are create attachments and cultural attachments that bind us to other people and people we don't even know. I mean, people form place attachments to the Statue of Liberty, even if they've never been there. And these imaginaries, one would say, these, again, a public space or public symbol, create certain kinds of relationships that um, I really feel um, uh, have duration, uh, create public culture, back to um, that, that can uh, be transmitted and circulated and make a difference in the uh, public sphere. Um, I haven't talked, I, I talk a lot usually in, under the social justice um, section about cultural representation and I haven't spent a lot of time talking about it today. Um, you know, always as you present and I'm talking to you, I can already see different ways to present this material, but I think it is important for us. This is Prospect Park uh, near where I live. 
and um, you need to remember how important parks are for uh, cultural representation, cultural continuity. Um, these are Yorba uh, uh, Haitian offerings here um, in the park, in the drumming circle. And this is just uh, groups of people being able to get together during COVID to be able to continue um, their relationships. Um, but uh, cultural representation um, as many of you know, there's been um, actually movements all over the world to take down statues of people who, of, of, of conquerors and slave owners and to begin to pay attention to who is represented in our space. Uh, one thing I always want to add is representation doesn't have to be a monument in a public space that if you want socially just and spaces that uh, you know, uh, create cultural continuity, having people that look like you or having activities that you want to uh, uh, um, participate in, having, thing, having there be a place where you, you would feel comfortable. Those are also forms of representation and public space offers that um, in a way that, that, that no other place does and in a way that can absorb and accommodate multiplicity of representations and yet still bring people together. This park, Prospect Park, has all kinds of, of ethnic, racial, cultural groups there all the time. And they have their own little spaces sometimes they retreat to, but there's also a big promenade that everyone gets together and walks and and roller skates like a boardwalk in a beach. Um, that um, spaces that represent everyone, accommodate everyone, and yet at the same time provide spaces to come together. I think offer our uh, our, our where we want to go. Um, this is Battery Park City. Again, the role of public space in disaster and also in community cohesion. Um, their public spaces created a way for the community to come back together after 9-11 because Battery Park City is right next to where the World Trade Center towers went down. And um, we've written about how that public space really made a difference um, for people, for families and friends and community to get together. Um, so it's not just for the informal economy can public space work, but also as a form, um, uh, a focus of, of community cohesion. And um, this is, it says Melbourne, New, New Zealand. That's where the air came in. Okay, well, this is Melbourne, Australia. Sorry, New Zealanders. It's just a huge typo. Um, but I used it to try to talk, and what I'm really worried about that it could be wrong in the book somehow. Um, this is a study by Jonathan Daly about intercultural encounters and uh, how public spaces both can and or cannot encourage or discourage intercultural encounters. And this was um, this um, architect's idea of multicultural and um, I'm kind of out of time, so I'm not gonna talk a lot about it. I also am very concerned about this typo. So I think um, I'm not exactly sure what to do. Should I stop sharing my screen at this point and maybe take a few questions? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So thank now, thank you very much, Sita. Yeah. And uh, well, in first place, I would like to uh, take the opportunity that you mentioned at the beginning. So uh, to, uh, give, to to make the post, post, question, post question to you through email. So and I wonder if you can uh, uh, type it down in the in the chat uh, your address okay. you want to. I mean, I have one here. Is that one the, the one of the university? Should I put this? Is as yeah, you might put it in the chat. Put it. Are you uh, going to put it? All right. I put that one. Is that the right one? That's my email. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That's so, the right one. <laughs> because that, I'm I'm saying this because uh, we are running short of time now. We only have a couple of minutes to wrap it up, and uh, uh, we haven't received uh, any any question at the moment in the chat. So unfortunately, this okay. system uh, is very unusual for our four of our lecture series. We do them usually 
online, uh, offline, sorry, offline, so in, uh, in presence. And usually we do it in the evening, as I mentioned at the, the beginning, right. uh, pretty before the, the, the start of your talk. So we don't have discussed on this tradition of uh, uh, engaging with our lecturers uh, in this way. So I think that uh, we can uh, uh, work with that uh, system of email. But there are a couple of things I might uh, want to ask you before uh, wrapping up. The one is probably an annotation. So maybe it is, uh, you ask, you're asking, well, if you have an idea of how can we articulate uh, or uh, uh, come up with a better definition of public culture. And I have maybe something I can recommend. So Good. Because I'm okay. Italian, I would uh, uh, look at Gramsci and call it the public counter hegemonic culture. So the question right. of the hegemony yeah. and uh, how this culture is actually what we treasure and what we want this public space to be able to foster and develop. But of course, in a Delusian, world, in a Delusian way, could be well public relational culture because what happens is exactly the, the, the get out of this uh, system of alienation or abstraction and reestablish a system of connections. Uh, uh, and uh, possibly the last one would be the question of differential. Now is the favorite here. So the question of exactly opposing uh, uh, this system of uh, these domains uh, or regimes, if you want, or distribution of the what I would say uh, in terms of. Uh, exactly preventing uh, differentiation in terms of really maximal differentiation, contribution, and individualization that happens in public space. So that's just a, a note. Yeah, those are great. That's a <laughs> wonderful idea. Attempt. I love <laughs> it. A quick comment. I love the uh, counter hegemonic. A lot of people have been trying to write that public culture in there is counter hegemonic. I think it is sometimes and sometimes not. I mean, my, I can think of public spaces where there's quite a bit of counter hegemonic public culture being created and others where, you know, that's not the case at all. So, I mean, maybe there's a gradation of, of what goes on, but I like that very much. Yeah, and, and there was a point what you mentioned at a certain point referring to Jürgen Habermas, of course, the big question of the public sphere. So how it is right. necessary to make sure that uh, uh, people that talk uh, are able to be heard. So that's uh, right. Yeah. Uh, but another yeah. thing I want to ask, in the, I found it very interesting uh, uh, how you articulated through case studies, very important probably to show evidence uh, uh, when we're talking about these uh, complex uh, uh, aspects like what public space can do. And uh, the question is uh, very much uh, something that probably uh, comes to the idea of being encerrados, <laughs> as you were saying <laughs> before. In Cerrados, so this person used to be oh, in Cerrados, yeah. You said, well, in Rome. yeah, and that's that's a bit of a feeling that uh, sometimes we feel in this uh, situation, uh, which uh, on one hand uh, we have had this exacerbation of segregation, of social distancing uh, during uh, these last three, few two, two, three years. Right. Uh, but that's something to do, I guess, also uh, with the way in which uh, we uh, perceive and uh, understand things. So one of the things that uh, I always uh, uh, use as a, a point of reference for it is uh, that we probably uh, have to rename this question of social distancing. It should be spatial yeah. distancing, physical distancing. Uh, or physical distance. Exactly. Yeah. All, all we want to, uh, to avoid is that coming. Call it physical distance. That's what it is. It's not even spatial. It's it's. It, we're talking about six feet. That's uh, you know physical distance, and we keep using this word social distancing. But you know, I've written a little bit about that. I think people did want a social distance. I think the physical distancing, at least in the United States, uh, gave uh, certain classes of people uh, uh, the license to physically distance themselves from the city, from the dirt, from the whatever. And I think it's very much very telling that they wanted social distancing and a lot of stigma evolved out of it. I don't know about in New Zealand, but in the United States, the the stigma and and negative feelings about the other, it it really magnified it. I don't know if Absolutely. that happened where you are. Well, <laughs> it is quite complex, quite a complex situation. Also because we have been hit in a very different way than, for instance, the US. I remember when you gave the talk uh, at the beginning of COVID uh, around the particular impa impact that had in New York, uh, uh, essentially on different social groups, on different conditions, even right. related to different uh, 
uh, districts and areas of New York. Uh, looking at it, at, at it from New Zealand was quite a revealing thing because uh, here we have a much different condition of density of distribution and particularly of, uh, if you want, uh, um, the, the inequalities uh, in, within the city. Uh, but another thing that I want to just before wrapping up uh, uh, mention is, and I found particularly interesting, uh, is in one of your cases, uh, we, could, we could probably talk of in, each and every one uh, of, your, uh, of your examples, uh, but the one on sustainability and the question of uh, sustainability and public justice. And immediately comes to my mind the work that you've done with Neil Smith. And he's uh, important always uh, uh, accent uh, on this particular aspect. So we cannot uh, do anything uh, in that, uh, in, that in, in that aspect of, uh, say, climate change or environmental justice, uh, if we don't really look at uh, a much broader notion of justice, am, am I right there? In, in, in yeah, you're in you're right. I don't think I, I you know I think that all of this has to be predicated on a, a larger view of justice. But I guess what I'm arguing, at least in this book, which is a book to try to convince the middle class. Really, the middle classes that that public space matters. That's who it was written for. I mean, the people who aren't sharing their public spaces. That um, it, we can start with public space is not an end in and of itself, but it's a place we can start. It's like going to the micro and hope you know working up. Because I don't know that I can restructure New York City, but maybe I could stop the building of something like Hudson Yards which is totally exclusionary. You know, I mean, what what is it? I mean, this is where Neil and I differed. Neil felt we only had to have revolution. And of course I was, I'm still a liberal and I kept saying, well, I get, I'm not gonna be able to have a revolution in my lifetime. So what can I do? I'd like to be able to stop the privatization of public space that is highly exclusion, exclusionary and argue for a very different kind of public space where different things can happen, including Black Lives Matter, protest, resist, you know, where something new can happen. That's yeah, my yeah, final thing. A, I want, I want, pub not yeah, I want public space. Between. I want real public space, public space where you can make a difference. Yeah, yeah. No, I, what I think is that there's not a hard boundary between, say, revolution and reform. So the two things <laughs> uh, have a particular connection. Oh, you say they come together. <laughs> I, we should have. We should definitely get together. We could learn a lot. I could learn a lot. So All thank right. you very much, Seta. We close it here. We are right two you. minutes late. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for participating. We keep in touch, you. and uh, I hope uh, uh, you will receive lots of questions, uh, not only for the, from the participant today, which I've seen uh, exceeded the number of thirty, but probably for people that can see it uh, in a recorded ah. version on right. our website. Uh, on the past award lecture series. Right. And we now, yeah, we finally have a question about indigenous spaces and reconciliation. Yeah, right. Okay. I, I, um, I will have to talk, we'll have to have another meeting. Claire, <laughs> hello all. Take care. Thank you very much. Could, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.